focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable. Hello and welcome to the Thought League, where thought leaders share actionable ideas for bringing about a change. Now today, we are going to discuss the relevance and the rising role of the global institutional investors in creating valuable companies which are sustainable and ethical. Joining me today are Amar Gill uh, from BlackRock and Cyril Amarchand Mangal Das. Cyril Shroff. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us on CNBC TV 18. Now, my first question to BlackRock then, Amar, uh, of course, the robustness of any financial market really depends on the checks and balances that various entities bring about. What has been the role of institutional investors like yourself in creating this and how has it evolved globally? Well, Checks and balances, there are lots of players uh, and stakeholders that have a role to play, um, regulators obviously being one, um, shareholders and investors in terms of stewardship responsibility and the fiduciary responsibility that asset managers have for the end investor. Um, and I would say that one of the big mega trends is the shift of global asset allocation towards emerging markets, the increasing exposure that international investors have to uh, emerging, have in emerging markets, which leads to greater stewardship and responsibility um, in, in, in managing those assets. Um, you know, you might have a small asset manager that has 0.1% or 0.2% in a company. And when the company does something that isn't quite right, that is value destroying, then for that asset manager, if it's an active asset manager, do you pursue this in terms of engagement with the company and voting in, in, in AGM or EGMs? Or do you just cut and run? Now, if you are an active asset manager with a small holding, and you're not going to be able to swing the vote in any significant way, then in the past, most of these active asset managers would have just sold their shares and ignored um, any engagement with the company. Now, things have changed. Over the last 10 years, I would say, um, asset allocation of global investors into emerging markets have continue, continued to build up. And when you have more than 0.1, 0.2%, when you have 1%, 2%, 3% or higher, then when a company does something that is value destroying, um, you can't just cut and run. Even yes. if you're an active manager or if you're an index investor like BlackRock with a very long-term horizon, you, you're, you're holding your shares for the long-term and even active managers, if they've got more than 1% or 2%, they can't just sell the shares in the market when there's a negative de corporate development. And, and then stewardship, and en which involves engagement with the company, and then voting on policy matters uh, at the AGMs and EGMs, becomes much, much more important. That's right, uh, Amar, and a lot has uh, changed over the years. Now the institutional investors definitely cannot be ignored. But Cyril Shroff, uh, this particular concept is still nascent in India compared to the other developed countries. Where have we reached and what is the trend that is evolving here in India? So we've moved forward quite a bit. So uh, going back a little bit in history, institutional investors were always important even going back to the days when the lic uti gic uh, were the sort of primary force uh, and there was a lot of influence by the ministry of, of finance I mean, i'm talking of the late 80s and early 90s but fast forward now to 2020 the institutional investors as a class i think are one of the most influential now and, mm. and a lot has changed because now the context is that one is that you have a lot of global institutions Secondly, the variety of uh, in institutional investors now includes mutual funds, pension funds, and you also have the rise of index funds like BlackRock and uh, State Street and, and, and Vanguard. So, they, and on the on the corporate side also, uh, corporates want to get into the index because it gives them certain benefits and it gives them a certain prestige and a, and a valuation bump. So, whilst on the one hand, the you know the the rise of these varieties and and the heft of 
uh, institutional investors, but also corporates wanting to be in that club. Additionally, what's happened is that uh, institutional investors are now not merely purveyors of capital, but they have also carry a fiduciary responsibility. Like, for example, Amar Safa, they carry a fiduciary responsibility to thousands and millions of investors to actively engage uh, with uh, with that with their companies. And there is a, also a big difference in the West and in India. In the West, it's more a owner manager conversation. Hmm. What's happening now, and which is what Amar was really talking about, is that now this is a conversation between two sects or two groups of large investors, with the promoters on the one hand, and the the broader community of institutional investors on the other hand. So that has raised a lot of new dimensions and a lot of new conversations, whether it's on conflicts of interest, company strategy, and. Um, the corporate governance conversation arising from the ownership composition that used to happen 20, 25 years ago, and the one that is happening now is chalk and cheese. Hmm. I know a, a lot has changed, but I'm glad that you mentioned one particular point which is peculiar to India about uh, the big shareholder that comes from the entrepreneur or the promoter class as well. That is peculiar to India. So, Amar, you focus on APAC. You are uh, in charge of stewardship of these investments by BlackRock in APAC countries, including India. So, you focus on India a lot. How is India shaping when it comes to corporate governance standards and transparency and where has it reached compared to the other countries in the region? Well, one thing I would set out um, at the outset is that the the, the concept of promoter um, is used a lot in India, but the idea that there is a controlling shareholder which is, uh, which is dominant in the market is not really unique to India. We, we see the same yeah. in China. And we see the same in Korea, mm. uh, in, in Southeast Asia as well. So that issue of the balance that you have to play between the controlling shareholder um, and when the controlling shareholder can vote on a lot of the resolutions, their mm. vote compared to institutional shareholders and other retail investors, that balance is something that uh, uh, we have to see um, you know, being in equilibrium, if you like, uh, a, a, across the various markets. Mm. Now, in India, I would say SEBI is a very hands-on regulator that is aware of the issues that arise in the market mm. and aware of trends that are happening in the region and globally and looking to see how India's uh, regulatory framework uh, would be best in class, at least for emerging markets. Um, and, and there are various consultations. You had the COTAC committee that was set up about two or three years ago sure. and the recommendation that came out from the COTAC committee. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of this is to balance what I was saying, the interests of the minority shareholders with the controlling shareholders. And there are certain issues uh, that came up from the COTAC com yes. committee recommendations that the you need a vote of a majority of the minority to pass proposals, certain yes. proposals. And those essentially are proposals where the, the controlling shareholders, the promoters, mm. have a direct or vested interest. So they yeah. should not be voting. And then it goes with the minorities. Um, so I would say the regulatory framework in India actually mm. um, is leading uh, among, among emerging markets. It continues to evolve. The one area that I think is very important for all the markets where you have these uh, dominant controlling shareholders, call them promoters in, in India, is that it's important that there be a lead independent director or uh, independent chairman yes. of the board who is accessible to investors. Sure. I think that is very important to get the balance right so that the independent directors have a sense of accountability beyond the promoters, that they also re they represent all shareholders, right. including minority investors, and they yes. should be accepted to minority investors as well. But some of the committees that you mentioned on corporate governance, uh, thankfully we have uh, somebody who has been instrumental in some of these committees as well. So uh, Cyril Shroff, uh, uh, you know, majority of minority by way of the Companies Act 2013, will you agree, was a big breakthrough in this particular aspect and brought about the meaningful changes. 
Yeah, I think the concept of uh, majority of minority was pathbreaking, but the origin was not necessarily in the company. I think the origin goes back a little uh, earlier. It was judicially evolved in the context of approval of various schemes of arrangement. Yes. By and, and in many cases there used to be differential treatment in different classes of investors. So the first evolution of this actually happened in the judiciary where as a condition of approval the company was told to get approval of the majority of the minority so then it came there then it came into clause 49 concepts uh, and then finally into it has sort of evolved into uh, been embodied uh, in in the law itself so this is profound why is it profound because what it does is that it carves a very important caveat to the concept of control if you take away this concept then somebody who has the brute power to vote a resolution and whether it's 51% or 75% will always win but what this does is that just from a corporate structure point of view it makes two lists yes one list where everybody votes and where the brute power will be relevant yes. and the second where it says no no mr brute power you stay on the side now let the independent directors or the sort of disinterested shareholders yes. vote on it yes. and that becomes a subset on which separate voting happens and that is where the voting power of firms uh, like amar's firm and other institutional investors becomes extremely relevant because yes. they are able to have a disproportionate influence that's right and uh, sunil shroff hold on to that thought because we will differentiate between the aspects that you mentioned so there are many decisions that are really taken by the company like either delisting mna sale or else uh, having the directors reappointment remuneration and some of these decisions can be overturned by the minority shareholders and some a uh, cannot fully be overturned we will differentiate between these and the rights that the institutional shareholders have over the companies they invest in on the thought league stay tuned for more on the other side Welcome back you're watching the Thought League and we are discussing the growing relevance and importance of the institutional investors across the globe and we are chatting with Amar Gill as well as Cyril Shroff so gentlemen we were talking about the clarion call in the intelligentsia which is impacting the way the companies have been behaving and how the change of behavior is really taking place by the global thought leaders really bringing about the real tenets and the new paradigm for corporate corporate governance so amar talking about even the ceo of blackrocks annual letter some emphatic statements made there as well yes um larry fink our chairman ceo has been writing letters to ceos for about the last 5 years targeting the ceos that are the investing companies in blackrock portfolios and and the point of his letter um and he does an annual letter that comes out usually in january each year the point of his letter for the last 3 years or so has been to emphasize that companies need to have a purpose a why you know of mm. for their existence what yes. what is the social need that the company is is serving um so for instance blackrock's purpose is that we want more and more people to experience financial well-being that's the purpose and everybody in the company knows that is what we are aiming for mm. and the reason why purpose is important is a it has to serve a fundamental social need and b it helps to gear the company into thinking about what is really important when dealing with crisis situations sure. and we all know globally we've all had we've all gone through this major crisis situation uh over the last 6 to 9 months sure. and 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 the point of the letter is to think about long term purpose yes. and how to get to that long term purpose yes. and that is the main point that Larry makes in his letter um yes. almost yeah so value creation and uh, but keeping in mind sustainability aspect that is what is coming out especially at these times also amar uh, but cyril shroff uh, of course uh, you know uh, there is also the material impact 
which takes place on the company for bringing about this change and the shareholders now are really getting more and more powerful in making these changes and having a huge impact on the company's strategy as well as decision making. Here I would like to differentiate. First, we earlier spoke about the majority of minority shareholders. There are aspects that we have seen examples now in India where a delisting process got derailed by a big shareholder. Apart from that, a big mergers and acquisition uh, story in the financial services space was also uh, cut down, shot down by the investors. There have been instances of how a healthcare company's sale had been impacted by the shareholders. So there have been various instances, stray instances. But how do you think uh, that the investors have had a meaningful impact all across and how do you see this trend developing? No, it goes back to the first point that I made that with the rise and rise of the role and the heft of institutional investors, they are going to have a, a, a meaningful influence. And they are not just bystanders on the side. And the old uh, theory of if investors don't like what the managements and promoters are doing, then the only recourse that they had was to exit. Uh, that no longer holds good now. Financial uh, investors like BlackRock are disproportionately now influencing global conversation, whether it's the, the, the annual letter that uh, Larry Fink writes or uh, the participation in a lot of global governance uh, institutions. I think it's fair to say that what these type of institutions think today, hmm. uh, the regulators in markets like uh, India think tomorrow yes. and the, the emerging markets actually pra start practicing day after tomorrow. Sure. So, for example, even these ideas of a woman director and diversity and purpose, these started uh, in these global conversations, now yes. they become part of the law over here. That's right. And India is adapting and adopting some of these uh, uh, very fast. But I would like to differentiate and not delve much deeper. But there are certain decisions of the companies where there has also been a uh, big clamor in the investor community uh, that is to do with remuneration of uh, some of uh, the management, key management uh, positions as well as also reappointment of directors where uh, it's not majority of minority. So there the shareholders may may not have a full say as well. Uh, but uh, Amar, there is a differentiation that we need to strike. While an investor can be active, there is also a trend towards opportunistic activism where some of the investors can get together and try to change the course of decision-making in a company for their own vested interest. How do you differentiate between the two? So I think a lot of these terms are used interchangeably and might confuse uh, some people. There is a difference between an activist investor, and a lot of them are quite opportunistic, versus an uh, investor that is active in engagements and stewardship. Now, BlackRock has a long-term horizon in its uh, investment uh, strategy. Sure. As long as the company is in the index, then we will be shareholders of that company uh, on behalf of, of the final investors. So our horizon is indefinite. It is as long, a similar horizon as the promoters. Mm. You know, we're not going to be selling tomorrow because the share price has gone, 20, gone up 20% or because we're not happy about the governance practices in the companies. So when we engage and we're active, we're active in engagement and in stewardship, but we're not a short-term opportunistic activist investor that's looking for a quick dividend payout and then the share price pops up and we are out of there. Uh, and 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 uh, and may or may not return. That's yeah. not BlackRock style. Now, the the long term thinking that we try and introduce in our engagement discussions with board members involves governance practices. Involves thinking for for companies to to share with us their policies on remuneration, for instance, uh, their policies on related party transaction, their policies on succession. Um, and on compensation, for instance, we try to see how these policies would incentivize and motivate management to be yes. thinking about the long term, not just about this year's year end profit. Sure. Uh, that's the kind of discussions that we have yes. uh, with, with management and, and board members. Yes, so creating an ecosystem and change of mindset over time is what we are talking about. 
uh, Amar Gail. And uh, Cyril Shroff, uh, of course, uh, we have covered a lot of ground. But what else needs to be done? And do you not agree that enforcement of it is also very critical? Where are we on that particular front? So I just want to build on what uh, sort of Amar is saying in terms of the long term uh, engagement and a sort of active engagement, which is very different from activism. Uh, so I think we need to, in terms of what needs to be done, I think we need to give more power to this. Yes. And in terms of, uh, you know, enabling this from market structures, for example, there could be important long term issues. And there are uh, issues about, you know, how much can a company's management really engage with institutional investors because the insider trading rules come in and you have UPSI yes. sort of, uh, you know, boundaries to meet with. So which is really about can we, we need to examine whether these companies can give feedback to the investors and vice versa and actually move into a feed forward uh, uh, environment where actually you can have conversations about getting inputs from yes. these long term institutional investors so you can think of the future as a really as a partnership rather than in terms of just looking at it from a check and balance uh, perspective and this sure. is what is needed sort of going forward as well and these are what i would call market related improvements in the governance framework yes too much of india's governance framework has been driven by regulation and by just a black letter law yes. that's i think we need to get over that now and move to sure. a more market market based uh, and very quickly, in one word, what is the future trend uh, for uh, this? What are the investors most keen about going forward, Cyril Shroff? I think ESG and in particular climate change, I think that's the big topic. That's because it. I think there's a recognition of the that's principle it. that climate risk is investing risk. This is sure. Larry Fink's letter of 2020. Yes. And it is a profound issue as we are seeing what's happening around us as well. Yes. I think that is probably the biggest, biggest long-term trend. Okay, just to add to what Cyril was just mentioning, I think it's very important that the disclosures that companies are making on environmental impacts and sustainability should be material to their business and comparable with other companies in other jurisdictions, other markets. And that is one reason why BlackRock has been making a big push for companies globally to report aligned to TCFD and SASB, which gives, if you like, the gold plate of sustainability reporting globally. All right. So sustainability is the key. Thank you so much, Amar Gil, as well as Cyril Shroff for joining us on this riveting conversation. Thanks so much for your time. And the message is very clear. The shareholder activism is on a rise in India as well. And the Indian corporates also adapt to the evolving ways of stakeholder governance now. Now, the world is moving towards digital, transparent, as well as sustainable business models. And the challenge for the companies is to either reinvent or perish as the role of institutional investors gets more prominent. With that, it's a wrap on the Thought League. Thanks so much for tuning in. Focus, ideate, innovate, enable.